<laughs> you go by season? Yeah. Okay. People, that's that's the name that I was given, and that's the name they call me. Yeah. Okay. Um, we just need to remind my sister not to worry as much. She's the worrier. <laughs> right? Sometimes your voice come up cut off a little bit. Oh, is uh, it? I don't know. Yes. I wonder so is, if that's... Uh... <clears throat> Let me see. Let me change. Um, let's see here. Let me try something and tell me if it changes. Unless it's, you can mute while you're recording. Nope. I don't know if that's going to affect your video, but I, it, for me, it, when you, when you talk, it's, it, it come out like, come out like 90% and it's a little bit that like pauses, but anyway. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. It shouldn't do that. Um, I'm in low data mode. Yeah. I don't know. So is it more of a delay? Is that what it is? At right now, you sounds perfect, but a few seconds okay. ago when you were talking, it was like, a, it was like, maybe, maybe it's going to be fine. I, I don't know. This hmm. is fine. Don't worry about it. Okay. We'll make it work. And then if, if it becomes really hard to understand, then just tell me, and like, like you said, we can patch things together. It's not a big deal. Yeah, okay. Yeah, okay. Um, so let's see. One thirty. Okay. Well, I'm really excited to welcome, a. A new friend of mine, Dr. Tomas, and I met actually through my sister and brother-in-law a couple years ago at a health conference, and we were actually staying at the same house with my sister and brother-in-law, and I was immediately just captivated by his energy, by his knowledge, um, his passion for healing, and coincidentally, Dr. Tomas, his specialty is in oncology and cancer. And it wasn't always that way. And I'm excited for you to hear from him. But, you know, I was just telling him before we hit record that he's the guy that you want to have on like speed dial at all times. So don't worry, we're not going to share your phone number, Dr. Tomas, with everybody. <laughs> but he is such a, a brilliant mind and also just a really passionate person. And I'm excited for you to hear from him today. So Dr. Tomas, thank you so much for joining us on the podcast. No, thank you, you, Season, and yes, it was fun. Those uh, those times together with your family it was uh, it was a bless. So, we had uh, we did have awesome. a lot of so, we had a lot of laughs, a lot of fun, a lot of animals were involved. We were watching my sister's little cul-de-sac farm. <laughs> that was crazy. Yes, yeah, pretty so. entertaining. <laughs> Well, I would love you to share with us. So you are currently in practice in Oregon and you're a functional medicine doctor, but it wasn't always that way. So would you tell us a little bit about your journey, how you got started in medicine, and then what shifted gears for you to step into a more holistic approach to healing? Sure. I, I did my medical school in Argentina. I finished in 1998. And then I, I have some family in Cleveland, Ohio. And my uncle used to be a pediatric surgeon. He called me and he said, so what are you going to do after medical school? You need to have a very good training. Um, why you don't come here to the U.S.? We have the best hospitals, the best education. So I decided to uh, jump here uh, and then start speaking English. <laughs> because that was the first thing that I had to start learning is this beautiful language that I'm still learning every single day. The only people who can really understand me 100% are my kids. <laughs> <laughs> they say, Dad, you don't have any accent. I don't know why people don't don't understand you, but but anyway, so I came here and then uh, I started uh, doing the American dream. You know, when you're a foreign physician and then you come to this, I mean, this country, you go to the big hospitals and then you train in by the best doctors and you do, I did, I went to Cleveland, Ohio. I, I did my residency in family medicine. Uh, I choose family medicine because I like everything. Uh, and the only specialty that you can treat pediatrics and you can treat uh, adults and, and elderly people is family medicine. So, and it was wonderful. It's something that we don't have in Argentina. We have something called general doctor or generalist doctor, but it's not like that. It's a little trauma and then and internal medicine, but they don't see pediatrics, they don't see OB and pregnant women. And so it was awesome. So during that 
uh, residency, I specialized in woman health. So I became a GYN doctor. I did a lot of uh, PAPs, a lot of, you know, colposcopies. I become a training fellows. And then all my journey in family medicine with my patients are the one who actually push me for more and for more and for more and for more. So um, about 13, 14 years ago, I was treating diabetes, and then I was actually in the board of diabetes here in the hospitals in Oregon. Uh, I started in Ohio, and then I moved here just to Oregon about 13 years ago. So I was treating a patient, and uh, this patient was doing everything that I told her, and then uh, taking all these very expensive medications and shots, and her blood sugars were very well controlled, and uh, her kidneys were not doing good and they were not doing good. And then after a year of treating her, her kidneys were about to go into dialysis. Mm. So um, she uh, looked at me and said, like, uh, well, we did everything you as a great doctor uh, told me, but I'm going to go to Mexico and my old doctor is going to heal my kidneys. So I was like, okay, you go to Mexico. If this doctor uh, heal your kidneys, I'm going to actually personally fly to Mexico and I'm going to meet him. So 90 days later, this woman came to, to my office, and by weird surprise, I did a blood work, and her kidneys were not 100%, but probably 90% better, something that in medicine is impossible. We call that a miracle. So I was furious. I was like, wait a second, what is this guy doing that I'm not doing? So I decided just to flew to Mexico. The next day after I did this test was a Thursday, I grab my wife with me and say, I'm going to send San Diego tomorrow morning. You want to come with me? We're going to cross the border by walk. <laughs> I'm going to take a taxi. I'm going to go to Tijuana. And then going to meet this uh, doctor. And she looked at me and said, you crazy? It's like, no, I closed my practice and I'm going to go there. So I went there and then we went there um, on Thursday morning. About noon, I was, you know, taking a taxi. And I went to this house, and this house was a line of people outside the house. Uh, it's a big, big, big line of people. And I went to meet this guy. I don't know if I can tell his name here, or I don't know. Yeah, it does. yeah you can. Okay. Um, okay, so his name was Sergio. It was a very short, tiny um, Mexican doctor with a suit. He was probably four and a half feet tall. And then, uh, and then I, he looked at me and said, oh, wow, uh, you must be Dr. Tomas. It's like, yes, I am. Who are you? And then uh, the guy says, well, I'm Sergio. It's like uh, my patient's talking to me. I said, I know, but you did something with one of the patients of mine. So do you cut a chicken neck and you put some blood on this the patient? I mean, what, are you, what are you doing? And then he, he looked at me and said, like, well, I'm doing medicine. You don't. And then, oh. and then shocked me. I was like, wait, wait a second. I have all these degrees right here in the wall, and I have more in the other walls. I have degrees all over the place. Wait a second. I'm doing medicine. I'm board certified and blah, blah, blah. I'm coming from the best hospitals. I'm giving the best medications. And, and he said, no, no, I'm sorry, but you're not. And then, um, and then he showed me a little bit about what he was doing. He was doing homeopathy med medication with some machines that come from Germany. And then uh, some colonics and then some, you know, microscope and study the blood. And then he gave me five books and said, you know what? Read these books and then we can go to Greece together in a few months if you want. So I was like, okay, I'm going to do that. So we flew back on Thursday, the same day with my wife across the border. That's another story for, for an, another day. And, <laughs> then, um, and then I started reading. I started reading and I read on Thursday evening, all day Friday. I didn't go to work. Saturday and then Sunday morning, I wake up and look at my wife and I say, I can't go to work anymore. <laughs> and she looked at me and it's like, well, what are you talking about? We have four, four kids. You are a great doctor. It's like, I can't work. I can't practice medicine anymore. I was like, why? Because everything that I know is wrong. And then say, so what do you mean everything you know is wrong? Say, so everything that I know is wrong. In medicine, for chronic medical illness, is wrong. So that's where my path started, you know. And then uh, I, I bought a boat, and then uh, I was bringing patients to fish with me, and I was telling all this truth that I just discovered. And then little by little, so it was my patient. My why is my patient just forced me to wake up and then see there was something else than chest prescriptions and surgery and x-rays in order to treat this 
things that we call diseases. Um, yeah. So um, there is no such a thing that diseases, but but well, we treat it with just three tools. In our toolbox, we have medications, or surgery, or images, or radiology. That's the only thing we have. Mm-hmm. So um, and we label, and then uh, we label, and we label. Uh, s- symptoms and we put symptoms together we we label syndromes and then um, and that's what we do and we're pretty good at it and we are legally and socially accepted and then uh, and that's what we do all day so you come and say what do I have and say what symptoms do you have mm-hmm. we're very good at ask questions to discover the symptoms and I say I think that you have a urinary bladder uh, or a bladder infection. I think so you have a something called asthma. I think so you have something called like that. So functional medicine. Um, I was uh, introduced to functional medicine in Cleveland Clinic. Actually, in, in mm. Cleveland, uh, my mentor. You have a mentor uh, when you do your residency, and this mentor, her name was Tanya Edwards. Tanya was uh, a special family doctor. She believed in herbs before medications and then uh, and she was um, she grabbed me and says you know what this is your book you need to study a little bit of herbs and then uh, and then teas and this and roots and, and minerals and vitamins and you need to know a little bit about that and I think that would be uh, great for you so the department of functional medicine the building in Cleveland Clinic is called Tanya Edwards mm. she actually unfortunately died uh, years years ago, and then uh, but her, the, the building of functional medicine that's her, her name because she introduced to Cleveland Clinic the functional medicine concept. It's wow. incredible. It's not too that old. You know, we don't have fun- functional medicine in this country for like probably I don't know maybe um, twenty years. Yeah, it's I'll new. Say. You uh, know, one thing so one thing you so- you said that I thought was really remarkable, and it sounds like very similar to this. Tanya Edwards woman as well, is in order for you to get to this place, you were willing to check your ego at the door because like you said, you trusted this little man in Tijuana in a very poor part of Mexico who was working out of his house. You were willing to trust him because you saw results. Whereas I think unfortunately a lot of people and a lot of your colleagues and our colleagues in this space are are unwilling to realize that all of this money you spent and all of the diplomas and all of the board certifications that you've received maybe weren't all of what was needed, right? And and I love that like Tanya Edwards, same thing. It sounds like she was like, no, this isn't good enough. People need more. And so I just wanted to take a minute to recognize that and just thank you for being willing to check your ego. And it's hard. It's hard to realize what you learned for so long. You have to kind of unlearn in a way and and just be okay with moving forward in a totally different direction. Yeah, no, I, you're, you're forced by, by, by results and fr- frustration is beyond the ego. We, we yeah. learn medicine to help people when, when, when your tools are not helping your patients, you become very, uh, your self team and everything become like what I'm doing actually. So it's, it's, it's beyond the ego. It's like you're doing something wrong and then it's not working and it's like, See, just it's it's incredible. It's it's incredible. It's like I'm. I really think that it's an awakening uh, in the worldwide right right now uh, mm-hmm. in the MD world. I mean, you're talking about functional medicine, the Cleveland Clinic right now, and they talk about probiotics and prebiotics, and it's like leaky gut, and then they talk about yeah. uh, all the things. For me, it's like whoa! It's like wow, these big hospitals actually are there thinking that it's such a thing as leaky gut and leaky brain and and all this very functional medicine diagnosis again mm-hmm. and uh, and i think it's uh I, I think it's wonderful so we're going in the correct directions uh um i think that um that is a, a good um blend that it could happen because uh the current medicine the current pharmaceutical companies has a beautiful research a beautiful microscope a beautiful biology so they have a very a lot of money so they can actually we could we could have worked just together and then and, and be awesome for humanity mm-hmm. you know but um but it's like a baby uh, steps and then uh, i i am very very happy that 
at least there is a group that is uh, is actually putting that concept of at least a functional medicine that is better than traditional medicine and um, right. and then and, and, and beyond you, you you know there's a lot of therapies right now that are more open to listen and stuff like that so my other patients were my uh, family and then my other patients were you know patients with cancer yeah I I have patients with with cancer and and the same thing that they were like um, we have three things we have chemo radiation and uh, surgery and then we don't have any other options and we cannot actually do anything else so I have patients who actually show me that there is something else and then there's other alternative options and then there are sometimes effective sometimes not so my passion was like into into that and there was an awakening and it was a, a call and it was a purpose that I was like okay this is my my family this is uh, my patients, my close patients, they all of them are like my family. It's my responsibility, at least, just to be aware, just to know, just to you know, to do more research about it. And little by little, it was it was amazing because I um, I, I I discovered this 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 passion that it was above and beyond. It's not about how to cure cancer, but it is about why we have it. Hmm. Um, and then. That was the most important discover in my peace of mind and to transmit to my patients. And then that is awesome. You know, when, when we, we, we create this war against cancer, you know, and, then, uh, and that is the wrong enemy. So, it, it, so that's what, you know, again, by force, by my patients and, and my profession, and, and opening my eyes and it's like you have an obligation now to understand this and to treat this different and to understand this very complex uh, subject in a different way and then when we have an understanding um, then the digestion of the treatment of the of the expectations change completely hmm. you know when they tell you that you have fever and the fever or high temperature is good for your baby or is good for you, uh, maybe you're panicking and you're understanding and, and then your reactions and your treatments start changing a little bit. And mm-hmm. I said, well, wait a second, why is it good for my baby? And then when somebody understands and, and, and explain to you, I said, oh, that makes sense. And so the same thing happened with this chronic inflammation called cancers. So uh, that's my passion and that's my dream and that's my purpose nowadays and then I, I am, love uh, that probably you said, 90% involved with this now yeah and that's the majority of your patients now is is cancer correct mm-hmm. okay mm-hmm. so you had yeah. said something when we were together and you said you know we need to learn especially when you made that mention of this war on cancer And that's what it's been since Richard Nixon declared the war on cancer. And clearly we haven't made much progress, but Mm -hmm. it's this war. And you had made a comment when we were together about a month ago or so. You said, we need to learn to live with all of these things. We need to learn to live with the the 5G and live with the mold and live with the bacteria. And we have to be willing to adapt and learn to live with it. And it's such an opposite analogy than the war against cancer. So will you... Tell us a little bit about that. Like when you have a patient come into you with this diagnosis, like you said, and let's say it's a, I know you, mm-hmm. you work with some of the most advanced diagnosis diagnoses. You have a patient come mm-hmm. into you. Where do you kind of begin with that process of helping them get their, their mind right and, and understanding this, this cancering process from your perspective? Well, the first thing I told them that, um, I have to, I have to respect their um, their uh, panicky and their fear and all that conflict. It's mm-hmm. a conflict. It's an emotional conflict that's going through them. It's the second emotional conflict. Um, this uh, emotional conflict has, has a purpose. So, um, to my patients, the first thing I tell them that the cancer is not here to kill them. The cancer is here to help them. And then they need to love their cancer and be very proud and happy that they have it. Because if Mm -hmm. they didn't have it, 
they would not be here a long time ago. So mm. the first thing that I told them is, is, is like to slow down. You don't want to take this away from you. You want to understand why you have it. And if you understand why you have it, you would be very happy with this. Like having, a, having like if you're in the middle of, the, of a lake, like the lake is really, really cold, and you're in a little tiny boat, and it's a very stormy outside, and you get inside the water, and you fell in the water, I give you a life jacket, and the life jacket is gonna help you to give you time for you to swim back in the boat, or if you we're close to the shore, you can go back to the shore. So the life jacket is a cancer. So the life mm-hmm. jacket is what is saving you so you don't drown. Can you live in the water for a long time if it is very cold? No, you can't. Mm-hmm. Nobody can. And it's not intended for you to live in the water. It's just to give you enough time to, um, you can jump in the water to understand why you fall in the first instance because you were drunk, because you were party too much, because you were not paying attention, and that's why you fall in the water. And then uh, to give you understand what in reality, what was that fight that you were having in the boat? You were having this very nasty fight, and then all of a sudden you lose control and you fell inside the water. So now you're gonna be being clear about what is actually really important. Because now mm-hmm. I'm gonna drown. Is that fight is really important? Or was not important so it was it's a beautiful reason that you have this life jacket and then everybody is doing war against life jackets it's crazy mm. <laughs> we need to have them we need to have a, a lot animals don't need a lot of life jackets you know what they don't argue a lot <laughs> they don't have a lot of uh, conversations and a lot of emotions so i always say we need to learn from nature and then we need to understand what nature is doing. And then uh, nature is perfect. Whoever created nature is very smart. Is that right? Yeah, right. <laughs> he doesn't exactly. make a mistake. Oh, he, oh, he didn't. Oh, it didn't. That person, that was very hard to say he or she or it didn't. So this entity, it didn't do any mistake. So we are part of nature we are making of the same elements we have the same chemistry table elements of nature so we don't make mistakes so if we understand about these diseases or this chronic inflammation of these things called cancer then we need to check in nature so nature has them uh most likely they don't they don't that they have this inflammations as the one they're close to us of feeding by us so we go to the zoo Yes, we can see a lot of cancer in animals and elephants and giraffes and stuff like that Um, because we feed them and we transmit them our emotions and stuff like that. But in in the woods, in the jungle, we're not going to see this too much. Almost Mm -hmm. none. There is a genetic, and I hate to talk about genetics, but there is a predisposition uh, predisposition with the genes of a genetic cancer Mm -hmm. that um, is probably less than 2%. They say it's 2.3%, but I would say it's way less than that. Uh, that's to preserve the species, for like, just control how much of one species is, is, is growing. But that's, uh, that's not the 20 or 30% or 35% that we have right now in humans. So it's like, uh, it's completely insane. So, um, wow. um, so what we need to understand is we have this and we have more and more and more of this. And then... Um, and then I think so it's by necessity, by necessity of an adaptation and a temporary adaptation. Uh, and then by necessity of all these feelings and communications, the way that we're communicating now compared to 50 years ago is huge. It's 10 times more. You know, uh, 100 years ago, you were talking to maybe 20 people a day. Um, and the people who live in your town or in your house, uh, right now we're talking to a hundred people a day and we get in information for thousands of people in in right in a day so we need to process a tremendous amount of conflicts hmm. and emotions for a lot of more people so it's not just the 5g the 5g's give you the opportunity to actually get more conflict at the same time so it's a necessity we need to go through the 6g 10g and 20g 
And but that's going to give us like more and more responsibilities just to handle this mm. conflicts. That at the yeah. end we are in, we are born and we're on this planet to have conflicts. So that's the the, the 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 beauty of life is to have conflicts, and then when you have these conflicts, you can change and you can adapt and you can grow. So when we have conflicts, we can change, we can adapt, and we can grow. One of the consequences of having conflicts is a biological response to that conflict. So when you have a conflict, like your pet die, uh, or you know your um, your house burn, or something, you know, like an emotional conflict, there is a biological response to that conflict. So it's the consequences of that, and the consequences of that conflict is what we call cancer. Mm. So, so it's, it's in the, what you're saying. It's the digestion it. of that conflict. Yeah. So it, it is understanding, getting clear with what you said, this idea that, you know, cancer is an opportunity to step into deeper healing and, and really help heal these conflicts that were maybe unresolved, but also learning to live in a more um, peaceful intentional state as you're walking through the healing journey with cancer. Mm -hmm. yeah. What do you, no, so there's I, a story. Yeah, go oh, ahead. go ahead. No, 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 go ahead. Well, you had shared a story about one of your, um, I, it might've been a, a colleague. I'll say that because I, I don't, I don't know how personal this information is. Um, but it was a colleague of yours and this colleague was recently diagnosed with cancer. And, you know, in this same idea of like understanding, looking at cancer is changing our whole perspective on it and looking at it as this beautiful opportunity to step into deeper healing and, and help resolve unresolved issues. Right. But then we have to also latch on to the belief that we can heal and the belief that our body can do what it's supposed to do. And you have this colleague that was diagnosed with cancer and you, you'll have to tell the story, but it was, she, she received the results, but hadn't looked at them and you had looked at them and you gave her a response to these results that was different than what the results showed. Do you, do you know what, I, which story I'm referring to? Yeah. Is that something also, you're able to hear? It's very, very similar. But yes. No, absolutely. So, so tell us that story. Cause I think it, day. Yeah. So yeah, so when, when you receive an image or, or a tumor marker, um, is the interpretation of that is, is huge for the patient. It's huge because you put all your emotions and all your faith and all your conflicts. Remember I told you about an emotional conflict? So the emotional conflicts give you, in the beginning, let's, let's start backwards a little bit. The emotional conflicts in the beginning, the burning house, the dying, the dead pet that you have in your house, it give you a chronic inflammation. It give you a cancer. When you are diagnosed with that cancer, that fear that that diagnosis give it to you, it create another conflict now. Okay. Mm -hmm. So when the patients come to see me, they not only have the original one that I try to explain to them and then try to discover and try to explain this, like, and we, if we don't fix this one in the beginning, this one is still going to grow, it's still going to be doing this stuff. But now they have this one that is creating a third one. So when they send to me the CT scans and when they send to me about, I always tell them, it's like, you really want to know this? I want to know. I don't know because they guide me if I'm the correct path with my therapies and my correct path with my techniques and then we are in the correct path. And sometimes seeing nodules and sometimes seeing markers going up during therapy, it means nothing. Actually, it means that it's pretty good and it's healing. There is mm -hmm. an inflammatory phase in the treatments, especially in, in immunotherapy right now, cancer, there is an inflammatory response and that is excellent. And when the people yeah. do the CT and the people do scans and people do blood works and markers, for them is this is growing, this is eating me, this is uh, this uh, death is coming sooner, 
And then that, that created tremendous conflict that I can treat. Mm. So fear, lack of, lack of faith, I can't, I can't treat it. There is not enough, there's not enough medicine, there's not enough love that are able to treat that. So mm. I told him, it's like, I can treat every cancer, and trust me, I can probably treat every cancer. I cannot treat every patient with that cancer. Mm. So the cancer is simple. The patient with that cancer is the problem. Yeah, the cancers are all simple. They all like to eat sugar. They don't like oxygen. You know, they're pretty simple. But the patient with that is the problem. Mm -hmm. And if the root cause, the root cause that was the conflict, the conflict, the root cause, is not being acknowledged, is not being uh, understand, is not being taken care or digest or forgive better that original biological response of cancer is not going to get better. Mm. You can kill it. You can destroy it with chemotherapy, with radiation. You can do whatever you want. It's going to come back. Two uh. years, three years, five years, it's going to come back. Because it needs to come back. You didn't learn how to stop dancing in the edge of your boat. <laughs> right. You, know, you, don't need, you, don't, you don't learn how to stop arguing in, in the boat with all these people. You cannot have 20 people in your boat. You have to have only two people. Or maybe you need to be alone. So if you don't learn that, I can put you back in the boat two times, three times, four times, but guess what? You're going to go back into the water again. Yeah. You know, so that's what we need to learn. So we need to learn about the root cause. This is good for me. And the German medicine. So what I'm telling you on this analogy about conflicts and biological response, so the conflicts create cancers, is, is, is not based on me. Is based actually has some science behind some science from embryology, uh, some science from how we are created and the layers, and depends what type of feelings or conflicts you're having. Those layers are being affected, and then you're going to have different type of cancers. So each cancer has their own target type of conflicts. That is called the new uh, German medicine. Actually, I was reading an article. The patient just leave me right here. Uh, it's the German new medicine. Um, so what, what they don't understand, even this German new medicine uh, doctors, is that we don't need to be afraid of the conflicts neither. We don't need to be afraid of the conflicts. We are born here to have conflicts. So mm. it's like a, my mom used to tell me, it's like, oh, Tomas, you're going to have your cross. You know, you're going to carry your, your cross some, some, someday, you know, kind of like you're going to have your conflicts, you know, coming out yeah. to your life. And then I, I, I always look at her, it's like, why do you want me to have these crosses, you know, me? And then, and then uh, well, now I understand, it's kind of like we, we all have to carry these crosses of these conflicts. That's what we are here. We're not here just to walk free and then that, because if we do that, we don't need to be here. Right. We were not be yeah. here at all. So the reason we go, we are here and then we live this life in 20 years or one year or five years or whatever time or length. Sometimes it's three months inside the baby of a belly of a woman. Sometimes we need to be those three months, you know, just to complete that conflict. So it depends. So when we are here, we are here just to have those conflicts or those crosses or whatever we, we, we want to call them. German medicine called conflicts, emotional conflicts. And then uh, and, and how we handle them is the learning. How we handle those conflicts is the learning. And there is one vaccine, and I don't like to say vaccine too much because all this IAs is going to listen to my, <laughs> my, my, my voice. <laughs> so it's one vaccine or one antidote um, or one medication to be immune to this emotional conflict to all of them and that is unconditional love mm. so when we learn when we learn unconditional love I, I think that we are 99.9% uh, immune and then um, 
it's, it's a process of learning that, you know, it's a process of learning that. They say and, questions about why the baby doesn't have unconditional love and why the, 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 the embryo has, has unconditional love or something like that. That's what we give it to, you know, there is a, it's a matter too, there is a, it's a mass and a matter that is, you know, constantly exposed to all these emotions too, not the one that we create, but the one that bombard to us. So, but, um, but it's unconditional love. So we, we learn in 20 years and 30, 40, 60 or 80 years to be unconditional love. And it's so hard. There's a few humans in, in, uh, in, in, in history, human history, who actually mastered that, that they didn't have cancer. <laughs> and, uh, and because it's impossible. It's impossible. And you, it's impossible that an emotions will create that conflict. You think about the you last... you don't have any bad emotion. Right. Well, and think about how much sickness we've seen develop recently, how many more diagnoses we're seeing, and what did the last three years give? I mean, there was so much conflict, right? So much of that, and for many, probably just chronic um, conflict constantly, just whether they were wrapped up in what was happening in the world or animosity toward their neighbor or all of the things. And so I there, that is such a, a good reminder that again, even coming back to that first thing that you had, you had said was we have to learn to live in this world and adapt to the conflicts, whether that conflict is, you know, a toxin or an emotion or whatever it is. I'm curious, you know, you had, so you had said to me, we were talking about a couple of different therapies that you do. And, and by the way, for those of you listening, we're going to link um, Dr. Tomas's website and you'll see he, he actually does a ton of different therapies and treatments and medication if necessary, all the things like he is a full functioning doctor. But the reason that I think what sets him apart is just this focus on getting to the root cause of your emotions and how are you going to walk into this and what is your belief around this? And, and that's why I think this is so special, but I had asked you a question um, as we were talking about different treatments, and I think it was for a friend of mine. And I said, if they're worried about this, I, I can't remember exactly how I asked you, but I said, um, you know, they're worried about this, so they want to go get a scan and to follow up. And your response really surprised me. Now it makes sense hearing this, but you said, you tell people that if they want to go get like, and you mentioned, you touched on this briefly, but if they want to go get a scan, whether it's a follow up or, you know, imaging to follow up or to get an initial diagnosis, what you said, season, I always say, before you go do that first, ask yourself, what are you going to do with that information? And I was like, oh my gosh, that's so powerful, right? I mean, you said it. <laughs> so don't order the test. It, 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 another mentor of, of me always say, don't order a test if you don't know if you don't know what to do with the results. So uh, don't order a blood work if you don't know how to read it. Don't order an images if you don't know what you're going to do with the results, because um, you know, as as you create more problems and more conflicts with that than anything else, um, we have for you to to know, we have six stage four cancer in our life term. So after 75 or 78 years, years or so, you went through four to six stage four, like very bad cancers in our body that because you were not aware, you didn't care. You're born with 60 million cells of cancer cells, you know, in your body when you're born one day old, baby. And then uh, the baby doesn't know, the mom doesn't know, the father doesn't know, the immune system knows, and then it's taking care. So it's, there's some, something normal that when we don't know, it's perfectly fine. But when we know, and that I experienced that in medicine too, because I have this early patients that the family say, don't tell grandpa, because if you tell grandpa that he has the prostate, he's going to die. Mm. This is totally fine. He's in the farm, he's doing the farm, but the PSA is so high and, you know, he's touching his back a little bit, but and here we go. It's like, I cannot be like that. I have, I'm a doctor. I need to tell the truth. I need to tell the information, the patient deserve and blah, blah, blah. And my philosophy was always like, you know, 
be honest, straightforward, and then sir, I'm sorry, you have cancer, and then and then it's, and the, the guy is like, do I have it? It's like, yes, you do have it. I mean, we have this option, this option, and this option. And the, the woman is like, no, I don't want anything, you know. And then here we go. Two months later, three, three, three months later. Now I create the conflict. I create mm-hmm. the fear. I create the, you know, the no self worth or you know self validation. You know, it's like I, I'm done. That's it. He told me that I'm done. And then uh, and he was dead, like three, three, three months ago. And then and there was other patients that respect the wishes of the family, and they were going a year, two years, and then uh, I was taken house. Like wow. This this things this market were going up. He never knew about it, and then I had you know permission for the family stuff like that, and and it was it was wow. incredible. I was like oh, wow, so if they don't know actually they actually sometimes it's better sometimes I'm not saying all the time but some some sometimes right. was, was was better. So that's made me start thinking about it. it's like wow, so really fear and these things actually is a huge component into this uh, treatment without doing anything. No, nothing. These people didn't do nothing. Just tell them or not tell them. So I started reviewing and I came up with this little surprise that we have through our lifetime several cancers and then severe cancers. But that's the reason because we don't do whole body MRIs. That's the reason because we don't do MRIs of the breast. That's the reason because we don't do this full body scanners, stuff like that. We go and find a bunch of things. Mm. And then we don't know how many life we're going to save with that finding so many things. So we're going to remove all these nodules. We're going to remove all these lymph nodes. Anybody who has 10 lymph nodes, we're going to be removed, but five, we don't. We don't know what to do with all this information. So mm. far, if we didn't do anything, I told you that I, I think so it was Israel, and, and I think so it was 1984 or 86. Uh, he had a strike in the whole country of doctors. So doctors were not working or seeing patients for a long time, maybe it was three months or six months. And then at that time, that year was the lowest mortality <gasps> in the history of that country. No way. So they say, and they have, they have, they have their argue. They say because it was not, you know, there was not, uh, the statistics was not running. And then of course, you know, going to see the low numbers and blah, blah, blah. But <laughs> I'm strong believe that I said, that was great, you know. The less wow. we do, the more people will, will, will live. I think, no, this, we are the third cause of, of, of death, actually, at least in the U.S. It's cardiovascular disease, it's cancer, and it's doctors. I don't know if mm. you do go to the CDC, go to Google, so we're the third cause. Of the, you think it was accident, you think it's poison, you think, I don't know. But no, we are the third cause of, of, of death. I think so. We are the second one, <laughs> uh, in in my in wow. my belief. I think so we are the second. We're competing with number one. But but anyway, it's um, yeah, it's it's, it's actually sad wow. just to just to mention that. But um, I hope we can get better. But um, and I think. But here's crazy. the thing. I, this is this is why I was so excited to have you on, and I've got to have you back on because there's. I just think this is. This in itself is a topic we could stay on forever, but I just think that this, and I, I hope those of you listening, this gives you so much hope. And even when Dr. Tomas said something about, he used the term just extreme inflammation. And that's what I've learned when my son was diagnosed. That's what I learned to look at cancer as over the time of working with the doctors and helping him heal and it changes your perspective. And so if we're looking at the, we're walking away from this we should be filled with so much hope because we can have control over our emotions. We can control how we respond to conflict. We can control our outlook on a situation, whether it's a diagnosis or a symptom or a, a situation. So I think that's probably one of the scariest things about cancers. And I hear this every day when I talk to a new family that's their child's diagnosed is, but season now we feel so out of control and it's true because then you're thrown into conventional medicine and they tell you what to do and they give you all, like you said, the three options. And then it's just, you feel out of control, but actually we can control a lot of, and and it really comes down to us. And you, you mentioned unconditional love being the potential antidote or vaccine to this mm-hmm. issue. And that is also mm-hmm. something we can control. And and maybe for those of you who are diagnosed or are walking through a, a journey right now, maybe it's learning to have unconditional love for yourself or learning to forgive yourself 
right? And and I think that it's Absolutely. it maybe sounds easy, but I think for a lot of people that that's actually harder than taking a pill. It's harder than going and getting your chemo treatment. Oh, it's, it's hard to hate to love your enemies. Yes, it's hard oh. to love your rapists. Imagine yeah. somebody who kill your kids and you need to love them. I mean, it's hard to because you would put in that person like the killer. You put that character as a killer and you need to love it. It's 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 pretty. It's 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 unbearable. It's it's crazy. But if you have unconditional love for everyone and for everything, um, that 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 thing would not affect you. It would not affect it anybody. Yeah. Oh, man, this is this is so good. I. I just appreciate you, and I'm I'm so fortunate to have gotten to know you and to to just have this connection. I I think that you I know you've helped so many, and I just can't even imagine the amount of people that you'll continue to help. And um, like I said, we're going to link his information so that if you're interested in getting a hold of him and and working with him, um, you know it's funny. I I always tell people in my experience, the best healers that I have met happen to be working out of small offices in these random areas in the world. And it's so interesting to me that like our, our favorite osteopath, Dr. Moreno, he's the same. He works out of this tiny little office in this little town, you know, outside of LA, this Mexican doctor you met is working out of his, this house in Tijuana. Here you are in the middle of Oregon, not in a populated area and working out of your small doctor's office. And I, I want to encourage those of you who are just like looking for somebody to, you know, and I don't even know if Dr. Tomas has taken on new patients, but keep an open mind and be willing to travel and be willing to go outside of the box. You know, we used, we've traveled always for our doctors and for our, our healing partners, I should say. Um, and so I, yes, I, I encourage you to do that and we'll put his information below. But before we go, Dr. Tomas, I always ask people this question. Um, I would love to know what is inspiring you lately? What inspires me lately? Yes. What inspires me lately is, uh, is my kids. That's what inspires me lately. It's, 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 it's my kids and then, um, and, and Jesus. <laughs> Yeah. And that's it. There's a two people or two group of people that I've seen them and inspire them daily every single day. So one of the things that made me wake up in the morning is um, that say good morning to a very good friend of mine, that is Jesus. And then um, and then uh, my kids, I go to the veterans. Um, my son graduated today, actually. Oh, today's, today's his graduation, graduation? In about four hours. <laughs> Yeah. Oh wow! And then awesome. I have three daughters, <laughs> three daughters that are coming up in the next three years, um, and then that is that is for me as um, that's that's my inspiration. That's the motivation. That's the my 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 my, my purpose is just to to see if I can can give a different approach to this unconditional love, and then there's a different approach to this um, magic of conflicts called lives. And then um, and we we can live completely different. You know, we can be immune. We can, we can be yeah. immune to all these things. That's very hard now, now nowadays. And then and help others. You know, if we just help others, uh, that's the help purpose of yourselves. Yourselves helping each other, and then they talk each other, and then uh, we need to talk each other and help each other. And that's that's the that's, that that's the magic. The magic is you know communication and and sharing and serving. I yeah. Think. Oh, this is so good. Well, you're just an amazing person and I'm grateful to know you. I know I've said that before, but thank you for being on. Thank you for sharing with just all of these people that now I believe have hope and can just hopefully change perspective in this moment and how they approach conflict, but also how they love themselves and the people around them. So Dr. Tomas, thank you. This was amazing. I appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, that was 